11 hour barrage by 1400 guns opens Field Marshal Montgomery's February offensive east of Nijmegen. At 10.30 hours, 8 February, infantry of the 1st Canadian Army jumps off on a front between the Maas and the Rhine. In the path of the drive is the Reichswald, its natural barriers strengthened by a belt of Siegfried Line pillboxes which run through the forest. Thick minefields and anti-tank ditches also confront the troops under General H.D.G. Creerar's command. A pillbox is knocked out. The main attack shown in these British films is spearheaded directly toward Kleva at the northeastern end of the Reichswald. According to intelligence reports, the Nazis are forced to bring up divisions from the Cologne Plain to meet this latest thrust. The Canadian 1st, one of the armies of Field Marshal Montgomery's 21st Army Group, is disclosed to be about 75% British. Inundations in the Rhine lowlands, coupled with terrain made muddy by an unexpected thaw, are among the great handicaps to the advance. However, the front which originally extended four miles is gradually expanded. More than a dozen towns are captured during the first two days of the Rhine push. Heavy rainfall floods the streets of several villages. By 11th February, Kleva is reached. Kleva is about seven miles beyond the border inside northwestern Germany. Enemy resistance is methodically broken down by infantry units with tank support. population of 22,000 and as of 12th February is the largest German town captured by the British and Canadians in their drive southeast toward the Ruhr. The advance nets 5,000 prisoners in five days. Below Kleva, Britons and Canadians drive on Goch, junction for roads running into the industrial district west of the Rhine. 81 millimeter mortar crews supporting the infantry early in February during the elimination of the German salient in the vicinity of Agno. Company M, 3rd Battalion, 313th Regiment, 79th Division, supplements its ammunition stock with German 80mm shells for use in the 81mm mortar. According to the company commander, the difference of 1mm in the tube of the mortar makes accuracy of fire impossible. The objectives are enemy strong points across the Motor River. Demonstrating detection of the German non-metallic Topf mine, 44th Division engineers with the 7th Army try out two sweepers. The SCR 625F, which responds to metallic mines, shows no needle registration, although actually over the top mine. When the ANPRS number one encounters the same suspicious spot, its meter indicates the presence of the mine. Probing and disarming of the all-plastic wood and glass anti-tank mines are next shown. Last November, a German field manual dealing with the top mine was located and reprinted by the 15th Corps Engineer Intelligence Section. Discovery of the mine in the 44th Division sector offered the first opportunity for complete analysis. Previously, some of the mines had been found in a German stockpile, 
but they were minus the igniters. Here, the igniter is shown being removed. And next, the detonator. The German manual contains reference to locating of the top mine by their own troops. Mention is made of a specially adapted mine detector, Stuttgart 43, which responds to a mixture placed in the soil covering each top mine. This mixture is labeled tar sand, camouflage sand. Air Corps films of Nazi planes being shot down by Mustangs and Thunderbolts, which provide protective cover for fortresses and liberators on sorties deep into industrial Germany. rail targets. Salvaging the parts of B-24s and other aircraft wrecked beyond repair is nothing new. But an Air Corps quartermaster outfit with the 15th Air Force in Italy has given a new twist to the use of scrap metal from the busted up planes. That's a mess tray he's outlining on a piece of dure aluminum selected from a heap of discarded metal. When they get a sufficient amount of adequately sized old metal, they'll start producing the trays for the boys at the base. What is taken away for this purpose actually makes only the slightest dent in the scrap pile the bulk of which is returned to the States to be sold. The scrap metal is unloaded at the quartermaster machine shop where the design and method for producing the trays have already been worked out. After cutting off the rough edges, the selected pieces are given an acid bath. A tech sergeant with experience as a die maker perfected the mold, and the rest is as simple as all this. The press is, of course, standard equipment belonging to the machine shop. Practically ready for use, a compartmented tray that'll do away with the pile-up of several courses on a single plate. Surface dirt is removed. Rough spots trimmed clean. And the tray is ready for issue at the next mess call. Old mess kits are turned in for the new serving tray. It makes things easier all around in dishing out the grub as well as receiving and eating it. A lot pleasanter than disentangling the spam from the string beans in the bottom of a mess kit. Preparing to respray Saipan with a DDT solution. Men of the 743rd Medical Sanitary Company load five gallon tins of the Army's insecticide. Soon after initial landings here last summer, an oily solution of DDT was sprayed from the air over jungle and swamp. The resulting extermination of disease bearing mosquitoes and flies was commended by Brigadier General Raymond W. Bliss, Assistant Surgeon General. He said, Now, if one mosquito is located, we consider it comparable to finding a four leaf clover. Respraying is necessary because the toxic effect of the insecticide wears off about every four months. After being poured into drums, the DDT solution is pumped into a converted belly tank inside the plane. Valve and pipe connect the tank with sprayer beneath the plane. As the plane hedge hops over the breeding places of malaria and dengue-bearing insects, DDT is sprayed in a pattern as regular as that of a lawnmower. 
Synthesized 70 years ago by a German chemist, DDT's possibilities were not exploited until it was tested by the Army in 1942 and then placed in immediate production for military use. On 21st January, British units approach Rumri Island, 50 miles south of Akyab, for the second Burma landing within a month. Heavy bombers of the RAF and American Air Forces wing toward the interior of the island. Bombing from 6,000 feet, they meet no enemy planes and only slight ground fire. 360 tons of fragmentation bombs are dropped on the fortifications in the wooded hills approximately a mile inland from the beach. opens up against shore installations. The coordinated bombardment reduces the enemy shore defenses. At 0930 hours, the landing gets underway. The assault craft head toward the beach near the town of Chaukpu. The men encounter practically no opposition. Within an hour of the initial landings, a beachhead is secured on the end of a heavily mined but disused airstrip. Moving through areas cleared of mines, the troops advance toward the interior on the city of Chaukpu. Within a few hours, the troops occupy Chaukpu. Seizure of the island of Rumri gives the Allies a new base with potential airfields flanking South Burma. It also threatens the enemy's important port of Tongu. Air Corps films of an aircraft plant in India. Under U.S. Army direction, it is servicing ships of the 10th Air Force and other Allied flying commands. 20,000 Indian employees and 200 American civilian supervisors work in shifts. The modern plant has its own foundry, sawmill, and laboratory facilities. Three times the management of this factory was bombed out of similar plants established in China. They were also chased out of Burma by the Japs. In May 1941, with the support of the Mysore state, they completed the factory at its present location. It is equipped to handle any type of airplane job. The plant's output for the past year included the overhauling of 650 planes and more than 2,000 engines. In addition, 16,000 belly tanks and many gun sights and gun mounts were manufactured here. The convoy over the new Stillwell Road approaches its final destination 24 days after leaving Lido, India. Although twice attacked by enemy planes, the six-mile column of trucks makes the 1,044-mile journey to Gunming, China without suffering damage. On 4th February, the first trucks from the outside world since 1942 reach the city's gates. The convoy halts outside the Westgate entrance while General Pick and his aides proceed to the speaker's platform. He's introduced by Major General J.L. Huang. This first convoy over this road, the governor and the commanding general of the General Simons headquarters is now presenting to General Pick a banner on which is scrolled these four letters, Sheng Li Zhi Lou, which means the road to victory. General Pick. General Pick is going to say a few words. General Lang. As convoy commander, and on behalf of the officers and men of the first convoy over the Lido Burma Road to Kunming, China, 
I accept this banner in their behalf. It shall be placed in a conspicuous place where all of the people who are involved with transportation over this great road may see it and be inspired to carry on and deliver many, many more convoys into China. After the ceremony, General Pick and his party leave the stand with Lung Yun, governor of the province of Yunnan. At the west gate entrance, the ribbon across the road is cut. The convoy rolls into the city. Firecrackers and cheers greet the trucks as they pass through the streets. Opening of the Stillwell Road means that aircraft will be partly relieved of the task of carrying gasoline and trucks over the hump to China, leaving more airspace available for other vital war materials. engineers figure on 60,000 tons a month of all types of munitions and supplies being carried over the new land route. American troops pushing the Japs back in northern Luzon pass wrecked Japanese tanks destroyed in an unsuccessful Jap counterattack at Binalonan, Luzon. At least 20 enemy tanks were knocked out in this action. A Jap who tried to commit suicide with his hand grenade killed before he could pull the pin. The drive south on Manila sees heavy fighting at Kami Ling by units of the 14th Corps. Advance elements fanned out south and east on the Lingayen Plain leading to the Philippine capital. Kami Ling is an important communication center in northern Tarlac province. The troops push forward along the highways through Kami Ling and Tarlac on the road to Manila. Continuing their progress southward, troops of the 14th Corps bring up artillery to attack the Clark Field area, which is subjected to heavy shelling before tanks and infantrymen move in. Clark Field glittered with abandoned enemy aircraft and equipment. Troops remove mines and booby traps planted by the Japs in many of the 12 airstrips comprising the Clark Field area. General MacArthur at Clark Field, 26 January, shortly after our troops had driven the last Japs from the sector. General MacArthur visits the Filipino cemetery at Camp O'Donnell, terminating point of the death march from Bataan. The camp was captured in the push on Clark Field and nearby Fort Stotzenberg. Preparations are made for an attack on Hill 70, strongly fortified Japanese position barring the way to Manila. This sector was honeycombed with Jap pillboxes and dugouts. Mortars, flamethrowers and grenades are used to root out the entrenched Japs. An explosive charge and a five-gallon gasoline can is improvised to blast an enemy position. A second front is set up on Luzon. Tanks and infantry of the 8th Army's 11th Corps, which were put ashore in a surprise landing northwest of Subic Bay, push inland in a flanking movement on Manila.
Some resistance is encountered from a battalion of Japanese entrenched in the hills about eight miles inland from Subic Bay near Mount Amy. Japs, unable to contain our advance on Manila, set fire to the area before retreating. A third front strikes Luzon from the south. Paratroopers of the 11th Airborne Division, attached to Lieutenant General Robert L. Eichelberger's 8th Army, aid the swift advance of the American troops in the drive on Manila by seizing Togatai Ridge, a road junction in the southern edge of the Cavite province. Togatai Ridge will give our troops dominant positions overlooking Cavite and the southern approaches to Manila. <laughs> 